I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be talking about Jennifer Moxley, and um, she's a, a contemporary poet living in Maine right now. Um, I think she's born in, in the mid '60s, and um, she's done a lot of work um, translating um, from the French, and she's also written like I think maybe three or four books of poetry, and also a book of essays, um, which are wonderful. Um, and I'm also inspired by her use of that form, and um, and she's also written an autobiography, which is really amazing, um, which I'm going to reference later. Um, so I'm going to, but I'm going to read from her book called The Line, um, this one, which um, was how I was introduced to her, and uh, <clears throat> it's a book of, of prose poems. Um, and if you read the back, it says that it's about the state between sleep and waking, which um, I would go with that. Um, it's a uh, which you know, it's a state that's literally a darkness, uh, especially now in this season. And um, but I feel that you can also read it as kind of a, the the darkness of like a broader like a, the darkness of any given moment, basically. Um, there's really no kind of relief from it in the book. The only um, hint of that it would be maybe the title, which the line which refers to writing itself. Um, and um, I don't know, I had some thoughts, so I'm trying to. But yeah, I feel that like it, the book, it, it's like really striking and it's kind of unapologetic darkness and kind of all the dark affects and it, which seem so, so extreme as to be uh, radical somehow. And um, not sure exactly how that works out, but at the very least, I think that it um, opens uh, perspective on that darkness away from that so that it's. Um, focus less on the individual and more on the kind of encompassing system around that individual. Um, oh, and I also wanted to say that I, I really feel that the, the cover art is analogous to these poems, that this is a, a piece of work by Etel Adnan, actually. And um, just these like really bold uh, black marks are really precise and cutting, which is, I feel, how the, the poems operate as well. So. Um, I'm going to read uh, like a selection from the book um, in the order that they appear, but they're not consecutive. Um, but I do think that the order in this book is really important. Um, so, yeah. I'll just start. The Milky Way. You are alone when through the time punctured present an inkling of reason found you. This illogical, indefensible insight momentarily tore the teleology of hope away from the future tense. Celestial intelligence of the embodied now, or the sense that you are held in place by two connected minds. Despite belief comfort, you are pricked by limits, social, material, psychic. All that you know but cannot explain goes directly into the woodwork while the plastics, like planets, refract emanations and thus can neither age nor help you. Is this the reason old houses comfort you? Their sleep allows for mysterious things, filmy journeys over ethereal banks, star by star stone stepping, beneath your feet soft waters of nothingness and centuries of hidden thought, events that work your defeatist will into a strange elation. The sadness of old mammals. When the idea of you begins to leak out of your flesh, sinew, blood, and bones, you will be nothing but them and their failure. Pleasures, fear of wastefulness shadows them. Artificial frames do keep thought. Conducting excitement into passive potential, the homeless idea squats in the object, informs it, and there lays in wait. Thought stops. No, not stops, is trapped. Trapped in yellows, greens, and browns. Petals of vision. Fingers the eyes touch. An encoded stream of fire from the mind through the body smeared onto blankness. Both are now doomed to one time and one place. There they sit awaiting the viewer with the key to illumination, a light like infrared that reveals what time's indifference 
to Madame's messages has managed to keep from view. The gift of minor eternity on a brief mammalian scale is not this relentless coming to be, but the tale you will later tell about it. It is a kind of love insofar as it moves you. Run through. Here's to a rhythm that follows the ear. Or rather, here's to you, heavy genealogy. You've been making me hungry for years. My nieces was your meal ticket. The bounty went right through you when it should have become a door. A door to where? To some place beyond these endless deserts of shoddy salvation. The legacy of your discomfort with loss and retention has made me the victim of my digestion. It's all a matter of perspective, and I am, as the vehicle of these violent processes, completely ignorant of how they work. I must guess, based on non-mechanical evidence and a total integration of the senses. They shall become one and none. Then the line inside my belly will show itself to my mind as it passes the boundary of my body's calendar into an infinity of days. Though this hookup may pain me, I suspect it necessary. The atrophy of private life. In the heavy fashion magazines strewn here and there around the house, the photos of objects and people mouth the word money, but you, assuming no one wants you anymore, mishear the message as meaning. Arousal follows. <laughs> the lives of the rich are so fabulous. The destruction of the poetical lies heavily on their hands as on their swollen notion that we are always watching. There is nothing behind the mask. Nothing suffocating under its pressure, no human essence trying to get out. Awareness, always awareness. Don't you see how these elaborate masks are turning you into a zombie? The private life is not for the eye, but for the endless interior. It is trying to push all this crap aside and find the missing line. Nobody, least of all the future, cares about the outcome of this quest. It is easy to lose, through meddling or neglect, an entire aspect of existence. And sometimes, to cultivate a single new thought, you need not only silence, but an entirely new life. two more from, from Jennifer Moxley, um, before. It was all promising, and all we thought about was what would happen. Now everything has happened, and all that is left for us to do is a lot of explaining. But there is a hinge up ahead, I can feel it. The entire book, its cumbersome cardboard pages worn on its plastic spiral makeshift binding, is slowly changing its attitude. This angle shift is imperceptible, and fear, never before a problem, is causing some static in the process. The present context is breaking up, and there is nothing that can stop it. I have deduced the advent of this shake-up by watching myself slowly abandon the things I once stood for and loved. Sorry, this is so, so dark. <laughs> so, um, one more. <laughs> the clock. Haunted by the repetitive chimes, you awaken to ambient noise and darkness. A vicious thought is doggedly making its way up from the deep. Clanging and urging, it whips you quickly into limpid complacence. You duck to avoid the depth of your being, a dark, low-flying jet. Surrounded by enervated limbs of skin, you make a feeble attempt to sit up. Present knives tread the tenuous thread of the future. Apparently, you have no more will than a moldy corpse in an old church graveyard. Lay there and listen to the chimes. <laughs> Actually, the, 
this, I mean, other, her other works are a, a really different in tone, so in, in case you didn't like that, then. <laughs> um, so, um, okay. Before I read the thing, so I'm also really glad that I had this opportunity, this, that I was invited to participate because I wrote something that I wouldn't have otherwise, and so that, I think, is a good thing. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, before I read it, I wanted to say that um, I was thinking also about the possibility that um, that an influence could be both positive and negative, um, and um, meaning um, where there's an affinity, there may be sameness, and that that sameness may cause a resistance to to change. <laughs> um, so, um, but that's just really has nothing to do with. Um, anyone but me, so. <laughs> and so um, it's not a statement about Jennifer Mox, is what I mean. Um, okay, so this is untitled. I picked up the cream-colored autobiography by one of my idols. It was 631 pages long and concluded with the French word for end. I looked at it. It registered less as a book I would like to read than as a slab of cheese or the cast of a windowless room. A loaded basement with no vacancy because everything was already inside, keeping perfectly still or the container would burst. I pushed the whole thing down the length of the desk without opening it into a line of ants that consequently went jagged. Since I knew there were millions of words behind the white cheddar exterior, I pictured all the serifs like monkey tails hooking and latching with each other. I mean the kind of monkeys that never switch partners, that hold their neighbors forever. Monkeys that may appear identical but are each one unique. Monkeys that accept the boundaries of their world. Monkeys that are also identical in spirit but are still somehow each one unique. Monkeys that are identical in spirit, but are missing a feeling of companionship. Monkeys that are the same and know it intellectually, but don't actually know it. Monkeys that do not accept the boundaries of their world. Monkeys always looking for other monkeys to imagine other rooms with over their shoulders and the next nearest shoulders that extend from their own. I bring myself to scan the table of contents. I pick out the chapter title, I become aware of poetics. Opening to it, I land in the early years of college at UCSD, and I'm instantly netted by this real narrative. She drops a lot of names, and I image search Steve Evans, the object of her obsessive fantasy at age 21, to see what a, quote, noir dream looks like. I quickly learn he's her partner of several decades. Knowing the ending, I can relish the story of the defeatist, my idol, and her debilitating crush. The word idol may be misplaced here, as might the word influence. We are more like a couple of mirrors facing each other, ready to waylay any subject by passing it between us with copious arms in our infinite cascade. We can write about anything forever, and if we stop, it isn't because we were finished. We have the same stupid ideas about books. We love books. We would like to pass our bodies through them. Not all of them, but even those we have hand-picked are too many for a lifetime. We'd like to pass through them as through a radioactive tube to overwrite the scribble of false wrist, second chance spine, etc. with pure literature. Sitting in the bedroom, stacks grow up the walls, names and titles flash. We know the feeling to read would be delicious. Advancing ever so slowly through the tube, our bodies elongate. The head moves towards the feet without wholly departing the place it started out. The smearing adds to the sensation of boundlessness we are looking to get from the tube. We rest elatedly knowing the warm touch doesn't stop at our skins, but penetrates a unit of air, a unit of earth, a unit of flesh, and one of water the same. Smiling is the words pool in our crevasses. We tinkle like an obsidian pile when you stir it. They send both of us through the tube at the same time as though we could not at any moment stand, unclasp each other, and walk apart. 
Indeed, just because we don't doesn't mean we couldn't if we wanted to. But I can feel exploding stars between our legs in a continuous circuit. Like newborn twins performing life in the womb, we're gripping each other's backs, mashing faces together. The tablet dumped in water issues a jet of tiny bubbles before it disperses evenly in a haze. In the same way that the audible fizz and light spritz from the glass comfort you already, the metaphors suggest we reconcile, me like you. But the two, ter the two terms don't collapse so long as you look at them. Until your gaze leaves them in its gutters full of slush, they remain both together and apart. Thank you.